right, why don't you guys go ahead and grab a seat. My name is Blake. I'm one of the pastors here. It is good to have you guys here. It's good to see some new faces and some faces that haven't been here for a while. This morning, I want to start off with a question. When you walk into a room, what do you think about? I was, a few months ago, we were sitting with some of our best friends at our house, and our wives had pointed out that uh, the husbands have this really weird habit that when we walk into a room, we just begin to size the room up. We know where the exits are. We look at the people that are in the room. We have an idea of just kind of the general feel of the room because we both have just this, this mind and this eye for safety. And part of that comes from me just being in church ministry and always being aware of those things that are happening at the church. And the girls kind of laughed at us, but then they started talking about what they think about. And they said, we're looking at the social dynamics and the emotional dynamics in the room. We're looking at the people that are there. Are they warm and welcoming? Are they cold and standoffish? Is the temperament of the room hostile? Is it really light? What is it going to look like? Are there, are there people that are really casually dressed or are they really dressed up? And we started talking about this and then I started looking into it more and trying to understand the social science behind it. What does it mean? Why are we looking at these things? Why are they important? Well, one of the things that social scientists tell us is that every single room that we walk into, we are trying to figure out where we fit in the social order of that room. And so we're trying to understand in one way or another how we fit in and what it's going to take in order for us to fit in in that room. And so while we're looking at some of the physical things, the women are typically looking at so, some of the emotional uh, reactions that people are having in the midst of that. And for guys, like I said, there's this weird piece to us that when we walk into a room, we begin looking around and we're thinking about physical safety. There's an innate question that we're asking ourselves that if something goes down, am I going to be okay? Now, I don't necessarily have to be the lion in the room, but I just don't want to be the weakest zebra. So can I like look around and see somebody else like, all right, things go down. I at least know that I'm going to get away before this person does. And it's a very weird thing. But when I, when I thought about this more and I began looking at this text for this week, this is what it reminded me of. And the reason it reminded me of this is that when we're walking into a room, we're typically comparing some of our best features to the other people in the room's worst. We're looking at our Instagram life versus people's real life. And we're beginning to say, yeah, I may be bad, but I'm not that bad. And unfortunately, what we need to be looking at is we need to be viewing people through the eyes of Jesus. How does God see people? Because if we're trying to look through our lens and we're trying to see how we're better than people, then we're not going to be prone to serve those people or to love those people. And that's what God is calling us to do. He's asking us to humble ourselves and to serve people. And so the text that we're going to look at today is going to point to both of those things. And I want us to keep this mindset that in order for us to serve people, in order for us to love people, and certainly in order for us to submit, which I talked about a few weeks ago, we have to humble ourselves, and we have to view people as valuable and created in the image of God. So this is a little bit of a tall task this morning, but I'm going to pray, and then I want to dig into the passage. Jesus, this morning, uh, I'm just mindful of what's going on around the world. Lord, as you have uh, just continued to push that on uh, my heart throughout this week, I, I want to pray for the people of Afghanistan, certainly for the churches and the believers in Afghanistan and the things that are happening there. And Lord, it is a terrifying thing to even contemplate what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, what they're going through right now. And so I just pray uh, for your sovereign hand over them uh, and over that nation and that you would continue to move and to protect people there. Uh, Lord, I want to pray for the people of Haiti. I know that uh, that country has just been ravaged over and over and over again. And with this most recent earthquake uh, just outside Port-au-Prince, I just pray that you would provide uh, the relief and the aid that people need and that you would bring uh, the workers to come in and to do the work that needs to be done in order to support uh, and sustain life. And God, I'm, I'm also aware just of churches around the valley. And as we were uh, talking this week, as DJ and I went out yesterday uh, and just thinking about CCV uh, and Scottsdale Bible and uh, Orangewood Nazarene and uh, some of these churches that were represented yesterday, I'm just thankful for the work that you're doing in those places, the way that you're moving uh, on those people's hearts. And so I pray that you would continue to do a mighty work in this valley and that we would continue to make your name known above all else. And Jesus, as I open your word this morning, I pray that that is what would resonate with people that there is nothing of me in this sermon, that I would preach your name and your message, and that I would get out of your way. So Lord, I pray that you would go with us as we step in now. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. 
So our passage from this morning is going to come from Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. Initially, I was going to stop uh, with verse 4, but in verse 5, there's something that's really critical for us to grasp, and I want it to tie together through verse 8. So if you take out your Bible, if you don't have one, there's one in the seat in front of you. Uh, If you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that with you as a gift from Heritage. But Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And this is what I want you to latch on to. Verse 5 is what enables us to do this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now this passage comes on the heel of uh, Paul telling the church at Philippi that if they are going to walk worthy of the gospel, is the term that he uses in the end of chapter one, if we are going to walk worthy of the calling of God, that we are going to suffer in the ways that Paul suffered and in the ways that Jesus suffered. And a few different times throughout this passage, Paul is telling the church in Philippi using if-then statements. So he says, if this, then this. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to get the people of Philippi to ask themselves hard questions. Now, Philippi was the city that had a lot of pride because they were in Roman territory. And so they had a lot of pride in this fact that they had the ability to claim Roman citizenship. And Paul is trying to push against that. He's trying to challenge that. And he's saying, if your allegiance lies with Jesus, you need to have your allegiance with Jesus. Do not let your loyalties be divided. And so in the same way, we need to ask ourselves that same question. It's not an allegiance to Rome, but do we have any idols that are standing in the way of us worshiping Jesus and following Jesus fully? And so he's not intending to make this a dig, but to help them unearth any unhealthy idolatry that may be in their life. And so he asks them these questions, but he says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, participation in the spirit, affection and sympathy, then complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with one another, doing nothing from rivalry or conceit, humbling yourselves, counting others as more significant and looking to the needs of the others. So what he says is, if you have experienced any encouragement, comfort, affection, sympathy, or a movement of the Spirit of God, then you should be doing the things that are in the second half of this passage. So when he uses the if, he uses the the Greek if four times there in this passage. And every time he uses it, it's an assumptive if. So he's not saying if you've experienced this, like maybe you've experienced this. He knows that they've experienced it because of his dealings with them, because of his time with them, because of the correspondence that they have. He says, if you have experienced this, in order to call it to mind for them, remember the times that God has provided encouragement. Remember the times you have been comforted. You have seen the Spirit of God at move in your life. Then go and do these things. Remember what God has done for you, then move. Now, the two things that we're going to focus on primarily are counting others as more significant than ourselves and also looking to the needs of others. As we've talked through the one another series, we've gone through these different one another passages in scripture, and we've looked at how God desires for us as the body of Christ to live these things out. What does it look like for us to practically live out and be the hands and feet of Jesus? Now, we've talked through different things like humbling ourselves. We've talked about serving one another. We've talked about being in harmony with one another, loving one another, and all of these have this theme, this underlying theme of unity that In Paul's epistles, you see this all over the place, that he desires for unity within the church because the unity that we put on display is going to show the world that there is something different happening here because all of us at our core are very selfish. So when you see people that are being selfless, that are loving, that are being kind, that are serving other people rather than their own needs, that is something that is desirous. You want to understand what's happening in that place, and that's what he's getting at. And this heart comes directly from the heart of God. When I was reading through uh, this week, chapter 17 in the book of John is one of my favorite chapters. It's the high priestly prayer. And in that, this is Jesus praying over his disciples. So you have John chapter 13 to 17 is what we call the upper room discourse. It's Jesus' last time with his disciples before he goes to the garden, before he's arrested and crucified. And he's teaching them all these things. So we see the foot washing and we go, and then he gets to this prayer at the end. 
And this is part of the prayer that he prays over them. In verses 20 and 21, he says, I do not ask for these only, talking about the disciples who are in the room, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So he is praying for all believers for all of time in this. He is praying for you and I in this moment. He's saying, this is for everybody that will believe in me. And this is what he prays for them, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So Jesus is praying that we would have the same type of unity with one another that he has with the Father. Think about the type of unity that exists within the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. This is what he is praying for us. This is the type of unity that we should be experiencing. Because we have the Holy Spirit in us, we should be experiencing this together. As believers in Christ, this is one of the huge blessings that we get. Go back to Philippians chapter 2 at the end of verse 5. It says, Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus' humility led him to serve. Our arrogance leads us to desire to be served. We need to flip the script on that. We need to look at the heart of Jesus and try and replicate the heart of Jesus. I had a friend share this really convicting thing. He's a, he's a pastor, and he'd actually preached on this verse, and he said that the one thing that stood out to me in this is he said, we are never more like Jesus than when we are humble, and we are never more like Satan when we are selfish and vain. If you look at those two things that are in this passage, the selfish ambition and vain conceit, these are the two things that got Satan cast out of heaven. You can go back in the Old Testament and you can see in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 these comparisons that are drawn to Satan where he says that he was full of vain glory, that he was in love with himself, and that he had the selfish ambition to replace God or to take a seat of authority higher than God. And these were the things that Dr. Luke describes had him cast out of heaven like a lightning bolt. And we are told to be the exact opposite. Our model, our person that we should be replicating is Jesus. We are to be humble servants of other people. In Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28, Jesus is talking with the disciples, and he says this, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I talked about this concept with my kids, and I was talking about how the first will be last, that this idea that we're supposed to be servants, we're supposed to care for the needs of others. And so I had talked to them, just, you know, remember the first will be last, and the last will be first. And so the next morning I was making breakfast, and what happens every day when I make breakfast is my kids fight over what I make, and then they fight over what plate they get, and then they fight over who gets to be served first. And so as I'm making the food, they're saying, I want to go first, I want to go first, I want, I want to choose, I want to choose. And my sweet daughter Reese, my four-year-old Reese, says, remember what dad said, guys, the first will be last, and the last will be first. And my heart just starts swelling up with pride. I'm like, yeah, baby, tell him, tell him, let's go. And then she's like, so I want to be last. And I was like, mm. And I, in that moment, I didn't know whether to be, like, discouraged or to be really proud. Like, she hit my other kids with the hardest Jesus juke ever, right? Like, just the next day, like, boom. See that, Dad? Applying scripture right away. But I laughed at it, and then I realized, you know what? We actually do the same thing a lot. We look at the commands of God. We look at the things that we're supposed to do, and we do them because we're told to do them. And then we turn around, and we look for the pat on the back, right? God, you see that? Do I get a jewel in my crown for that? Do I get credit for that? Do people see how humble I am? Is this a great thing or what? And it was, dis it was discouraging for me because I realized that we're always looking up for approval, but we're not looking up to the right person for approval. A few weeks ago, I talked about this idea of authority, how God has put authority structures in place. The God is the creator and sustainer of all things, has authority over everything, and that he had Jesus, who is the head of the church. Jesus submitted himself to the will of God the Father. And then after that, you have the church, which Jesus as its head. 
And within the church, you have elders who are submitting themselves to the leadership of Jesus and so on and so on. And our, our look should be towards that. It shouldn't be towards people. It should constantly be towards Jesus. God, am I doing this? Is this pleasing to you? This authority structure that you set in place is good for me. I need to submit to the things that you're telling me, even though they're difficult, because I know that this is your desire for me. And when you think about the humble submission of Jesus, it led to his exaltation, not to his humiliation. To a lot of us, and especially because we live in America, it's this race to the top. And Jesus is telling us in the kingdom, it's a race to the bottom. That we are to see how many people we can serve and how many people we can love and how we can pour ourselves out for others in this place that we would consider humiliation, doing things that we think are below us, when in reality, these are the exact things that God is telling us. Matthew 23, 12, Jesus says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And I want you to write this down. I want you to remember this because this was probably my greatest conviction this week as I was studying through this. Pride makes God your enemy. Humility makes God your friend. Pride makes God your enemy. Humility makes God your friend. So hopefully you've gotten the idea that humility is a big deal. It is something that we all need to be striving for. We all need to be pushing towards. And the reason that we need to do that is because it not only gives us a proper view of ourselves, it also gives us a clearer view of other people. It helps us to see the needs of people in ways that we can love people, in ways that we can serve people. It gives our heart a posture of saying that these people that I am seeing in need are valuable. They are loved by God. And it puts in us a desire to meet the needs that we see. This is part of what we're talking about here today. So what does this practically look like? What does it look like for us to consider others as more important than ourselves? What does it look like to meet the needs of other people? As I was studying this week, I was thinking through this idea of just the heart of God. Who are the people that we consistently see God writing about and telling us about? People that are in need, people that need love. And I was able to rip through this list, but I want you to hear these things because throughout scripture, we see God's heart for a lot of people. We see God's heart for the lost. Luke chapter 15, read through that. It's a great chapter. But later on in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 10, he says, for God came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you're to boil down the mission of God, this is what it is, right? To seek and save that which is lost, to reconcile it to himself because he does not want people to be lost. He desires for people to be in relationship with him and with one another. We see God's heart for widows and orphans. James 1.27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. We see God's heart for the brokenhearted. Psalm 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. We see God's heart for children. You see this all over the place, but I love this picture in Luke chapter 18, verse 16. Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. We see God's heart for the anxious. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now you can go through scripture and you can see group after group after group of people that God cares about. As I listed these people, you can probably think of different people that struggle with each of these issues and say, yeah, I know someone that's struggling with that. I know a person that I can expressly reach out to and show love that's dealing with that. But there's another group of people that we're not as acquainted with. 92 times in the Old Testament, you see this Hebrew word ger. Just think of it like a tiger, ger, right? Easy way to remember it. 92 times you see it, and it's translated differently, but it's translated as alien, as foreigner, stranger, and it's translated as sojourner. If we were to put that in our modern parlance, we may call it a refugee. Deuteronomy 10, 19, love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 19, 34, you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love the alien as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. There's literally hundreds of verses. There's 92 examples of that word in the Old Testament. But as you get into the New Testament, you can look at this idea of hospitality, of welcoming people. And Jason's going to talk about that here in a few weeks. But it's a big deal to God. 
And it's important for us to remember that this is not our home, right? If you look in scripture, it tells us that we are citizens of where? Heaven. Two people have read their Bible. Good. We are citizens of heaven, right? This is not our home. So we are all foreigners in this place. Now, when we look at this on a practical level, on a physical level, there are people that are coming to our country. This is not home to them. This is foreign to them. Some of them are coming willingly. Others are being forced out. Last week, you probably heard about what happened in Afghanistan. There are thousands of people right now that are fleeing the country. They're fleeing for their lives, and they're terrified about what's going to happen. They had to leave their home. Some of them had to leave family members. All of them had to leave their possessions and the things that matter to them. And you may not know this, but one of the main areas for resettlement in the U.S. is Phoenix. Since 1980, we've resettled 82,000 people here in Phoenix that are refugees from other countries. Now, I want to give you a little bit of backdrop on this. In the missions world, there's this concept of the 1040 window. And I put a map up here so that you can kind of see what this looks like. But the 1040 window is uh, this area between 10 degrees north latitude and 40 degrees north latitude. And that little rectangle that you see. And while it constitutes only a third of the Earth's total land area, nearly two-thirds of the world's people reside in the 1040 window. So 3.16 billion people live in this area, and the majority of them, 6,169 people groups, are unreached in that window. So that means that half of the world's population lives in this window, and the vast, vast majority, we're talking over 98% of these people, are Islamic, Hindu, or Buddhist. Now, that term gained popularity in the 90s. And now for the last 30 years, missiologists have been trying to figure out how to get into the 1040 window. Most of these areas, because they're Islamic, are very closed off to Christianity. So you cannot go in there openly as a Christian missionary. You can't say that I'm here to spread the good news of Jesus because they will not let you in. So what missiologists have been trying to figure out is what they call creative access. And they're trying to figure out ways that people can get in there as missionaries, but cloaked as something else. They use business as mission, so people that have business acumen can start businesses there, and under wraps of that business, they can begin evangelizing people. But it's very, very difficult, and the work is slow, and the work is incredibly difficult, and it's always dangerous. Now, here's the craziest part about this. For the first time in the recorded history of our world, there are thousands of people that are being uprooted from the 1040 window and are being dropped on our doorstep. When you look at missions, historically, you have had to uproot your life. You have had to go. You've had to learn a new language. You've had to settle into a country for years, maybe even decades, before seeing any fruit. But what's happening now is that there are people from these countries that are being dropped right here in Phoenix. And guess what? These people need Jesus. They've just gone through some of the most traumatic, some of the most difficult things that they have ever experienced. They're being put in a country where they don't know anybody, they don't know the customs, the language, any of these things, and they're looking for people to show them love and to help them along the way. And I want everybody in here to close your eyes, because I'm going to try and paint a picture for you. You're going to paint a picture for yourself, but I want you to close your eyes here for a few minutes and just think about this. You're sitting in your house, you're in your living room, you know that there's some things going on in your country that are a little bit volatile, but you're not sure what's going to happen to you. All of a sudden, your front door gets kicked in. Men with guns come charging in. They put a gun to your head. They say, you can leave the country right now, or we'll kill you where you stand. So you grab what few things you can, and you begin walking. You can't take your car because it's not safe, and they already took it from you. You barely have enough clothes. You might have documents for your family. You might not. Some of your family may not have even made it. They may have killed them to set an example. As you begin walking, you may walk hundreds of miles to try and get to the nearest place of safety. And while I say safety, that's a pretty relative term. You wind up at a refugee camp. These refugee camps are overloaded. They're understaffed. The average time to be resettled from a refugee camp is 18 years. Let's just say by some fluke, you wind up being sent to another country. You get resettled out of the refugee camp. You're put on a plane. 
You're dropped in a new country. You don't know the language. You have no family there. The U.S. government gives you $1,100 per person for your family, and they give you a debt to pay back the ticket that they just flew you over there with. And they tell you you have three months to figure it out. So they set you up in an apartment. It's pretty sparsely furnished. They say, good luck. I want you to sit in this moment for a second. I want you to imagine the feeling of hopelessness and fear that you would experience in this moment. Now somebody knocks on your door. They're bringing you a meal. You don't know who this person is, but you appreciate their kindness. Somebody else shows up. They're bringing you furniture, giving you some decorations so that it actually feels a little bit more like a home. Somebody else comes. Hey, can we take you to the grocery store? Buy you some groceries for your family, get a few things that you may need for the kitchen. Another person says, I want to teach you English. I want to help you as you acclimate to this country. If you have mail that comes in that you don't know how to read, that looks important, that might scare you, let me read it. Let me help you. Let me teach you the language. Let me help you with a job application. Let me go and be a reference for you. Hey, I saw that you have some kids. We're doing a program for kids. We're teaching them English. We're playing some games with them. You watch your kids celebrate and have fun and laugh and smile for the first time that you can remember. And although you know that there's work ahead, for the first time since landing in this new place, you begin to feel something new springing up in you. You feel hope. Now open your eyes. How did you feel? It's a terrifying moment. As you sit in those moments, especially for any of you in here that are parents, as you're picturing taking your family through this, it is a really, really difficult scenario for us to picture. But I hope that as we begin seeing these people stepping up and stepping in, that you felt that tide turning in your heart. You started to realize, man, when people serve, when people love, when people step into an area of need that I have, that is an incredible feeling. Why do I not do that for other people? So this morning, I want to throw down a challenge to us, Heritage Church. Governor Ducey said that some of these families that have been displaced because of what's happening in Afghanistan are going to be resettled here. And a lot of them are going to be expedited, that it's going to be a much quicker timeline than they would typically experience. But I want to give you this picture of what Afghanistan looks like, so you kind of have an idea of who's showing up. This is from the Joshua Project. If you're unfamiliar with the Joshua Project, I would tell you to Google it, but they look at unreached people groups around the world, and they look at what's happening in those people groups and where the, the people um, religiously fall, what happens economically, and they, they basically have these, uh, these metrics that they're measuring every country by, and the hope is that they're spreading the gospel to every country. And when they look at Afghanistan, they say that there's 70 people groups within Afghanistan, 67 of which are unreached. So of this total population, 99.8% of this country is Islamic. Now, while that may seem like a challenge, you have to understand that within Islam, you're going to have these different sects, and a lot of these people are being driven out by violent Islamists. And so people that espouse to believe the same thing that they believe are driving them out of their homes, are threatening to kill them, are threatening to kill people in their family. So when they show up, they're confused, and they're hurt, and there's a lot of pain. Now, a lot of you are probably asking yourself, okay, Blake, well, what do we do? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Yesterday, DJ and I went, and we were hanging with a ministry in Phoenix called Go10. It stands for Go to Every Nation, and they teach English classes. They do kids' programs for some of the kids. Their intention is to build friendships and relationships with those who are resettling at some of the places here in Phoenix. 
That's an opportunity that is open to anybody. If you go to their website, if you just Google Go10, you can do what's called a discovery day, which is what we did yesterday. And they'll take you around and they'll show you some of the different centers. They'll introduce you to some of the people. You'll get to see some of the work that they do. On September 25th, we're hosting a workshop here at Heritage with Phoenix Refugee Connections. And Berta Myers and Mary Keck are going to be leading that. And it's going to be two sessions that talk about how we can come alongside refugees. They're going to give some of the history of refugees in Phoenix and what it's looked like for us to help resettle in the midst of that. But maybe you're looking for something more immediate. Well, on Thursday, Berta emailed me. I was in the middle of sermon prep, and Berta emailed me, and she had told me about what Governor Ducey had said, and she said, I think it would be awesome if we as a church could come alongside some of these Afghan families that are being resettled here. She's like, do you think you'd be interested? Yes. Yes, 100% yes, I would be interested. That is fantastic. And so Berta is going to come up here after service, and she's going to be here. She will take down your name, your contact information. She'll give you kind of an idea of what this might look like. And we're so blessed to have Berta here because she's been doing this for years. She knows the ins and outs. She understands what it's going to look like for us to actually come alongside these families. You can give it up for Berta. Don't, Don't leave Yolanda hanging here by herself. So she's going to be up here after service, and you can talk with her and get more information about how we can get involved. But my hope is that we can bless a couple of these families and come alongside them and love them in this transition and be the hands and feet of Jesus to these people specifically. It was interesting for me as I was thinking through this passage and I was studying through this passage this week, I, I had hit a stalemate a couple times. And I told you guys about some of my process in the the midst of sermon prep, and one of the things that I do is I go through the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Just kind of ask myself a bunch of questions. I'll dig through the text and say, what does this have to say? And interestingly, the how was really easy for me. I just ripped off this list of examples of here's ways that we can love people. Here's ways that we can serve people. Here's ways that we can consider others as better than ourselves. And so the application wasn't necessarily hard, but it was also, what does God want to do with this? And Tuesday in staff meeting, we were praying for the country of Afghanistan and everything that's going on, and the question had come up, like, what do we do? Can we do anything? And it was this helpless moment of, I I don't know. And Jason wrote something, a blog post that was really good. If you haven't checked that out, you can read that. Um, Just, and reflecting on this, and Jess had led us through some stuff of just ways to pray for Afghanistan, some of the things that are going on there. But I was still wrestling with it. Just, God, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do, and it's super frustrating. And then this email comes in from Berta when I'm like right at this point in my sermon, and I just threw up the praise hands. I was like, thank you, God. I'm going to almighty high five right now. Like this, this is so good because this is the body of Christ stepping up in their giftedness and their passions and saying, here's something that we can do and something that we should do that immediately and just perfectly aligns with the heart of God. And I was so encouraged by this, and I was saying, you know what? This is what the church is supposed to be. When I talked about stepping up in your giftedness and serving in your giftedness and us submitting to other people in the midst of this, this is a perfect application. I'm so thankful for Berta and the work that she's been doing because I don't have to do this because it's not my expertise, but I can absolutely walk alongside her and our church can walk alongside her as she serves in this giftedness and this passion. So the challenge to us this morning is are we actually going to look at this crisis that's happening in our world right now? and do something about it? Are we going to view people as more significant than ourselves? Are we going to step up, and are we going to serve? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the challenge that came, not just with this passage, but just in studying this week. As I walked through and just saw your heart for people, It was a conviction to me that I don't have that heart for all these people, but I want that. I want to see people that are hurting and people that are in need and step into that need. I want to pair people up with their giftedness and the things that break their heart and find ways that they can serve as well. God, I thank you for Berta and her boldness in stepping up and just making the ask that needed to be asked. I pray for her and for Mary and for... Uh, all of the different organizations in Phoenix that are going to be helping in this resettlement. God, we pray for the families that are coming over, that you would soften their hearts right now to the message of the gospel in Jesus. That as we as a church,
church step up and step in and press in and love and put you on display that they would want to know. And when the question of why comes out, we would be ready for the defense. We tell them it's because of the matchless love of Jesus that we are sharing, caring, loving, and putting you on display.